For those of you who didn't experience the meteoric rise of John Jones in real time, it is truly difficult to put the levels of excitement that were felt into perspective. As perhaps the single greatest talent the sport has ever seen, from his pro debut in 2008 to now, no man has managed to get his hand raised against this dominant light heavyweight force. Or at least, that's what you might think. The year was 2009. And though the rising prospect John Jones was indeed highly touted, he had yet to find his way into the division's elite upper tier. The most recognizable name on his resume at this point in time was the UFC Hall of Famer Stefan Bonner. But even with that impressive victory under his belt, it was pretty clear that the tougher tests were soon to follow. Jones was building his experience, and at this point in time, getting used to the demands of the MMA sport by taking gradual steps up in competition, despite his clear talents. So when John was matched up against the inform Matt Hamill for a co-main event slot on that year's edition of the Ultimate Fighters finale, we weren't exactly getting a long-awaited elite test for this generational prospect. No, this was another step during Jones's time in the proving grounds, and by all accounts, it was a challenge he was expected to rise to without much trouble. Hamill was a good fighter, of that there is no doubt, and with a 6-2 record within the promotion and an impressive background as a collegiate wrestler behind him, he was certainly no pushover. Fresh off an excellent head kick knockout of the fan favorite Matt Munoz, and riding a two-fight streak of finishes, Hamill, through his run of form, had also managed to position himself just outside what would have been considered the upper echelons of the division. Make no mistake, however, John Jones was a considerable favorite heading in, and was expected to make short work of Hamill, a win that would set him up for an assault at title contention. And as the fight's early exchanges got underway, we again were treated to some clear improvements in the overall MMA skill set of the future champion. At this point in time, John's rapid growth in the striking department had seen him adopt and eventually master several high-risk, high-reward techniques on the feet. His Greco-Roman wrestling background made him an absolute nightmare in the clinch. But with each passing fight, we watched as the man's sheer athleticism continued to open doors for him in the striking exchanges. Spinning kicks, elbows, and flying knees, all hallmarks of Jones's trademark style, and all techniques he would continue to refine as his progression continued. And as he exchanged with Hamill early on, we started to see his growing maturity and confidence on the feet. He was fluid, focusing more on his boxing and his defensive movement instead of dipping too heavily into his riskier techniques. And when the takedown came, it was on the back of his growing level of control over the fight's momentum. Immediately, John found his way to mount, slicing through the defenses of his adversary before dishing out a relentless ground and pound assault. It all seemed to be going to plan for John, until he carelessly began firing off some illegal 12 to 6 elbows on the battered and bruised Hamill. Now, the rule that exists in mixed martial arts about the 12 to 6 elbow has been one of the more divisive and, quite frankly, confusing rules to have emerged when the sport's overall rule set was created back in the year 2000. Though elbows are allowed in any position under the unified rules of mixed martial arts, the utilization of a 12 to 6 elbow, an elbow that doesn't come in to strike your opponent at an angle, is completely prohibited. The old story goes that one of the members of the athletic commission responsible for creating the unified rules saw a demonstration of a martial artist breaking blocks of ice using a 12 to 6 elbow, causing an immediate move to ban the technique. Now, that story is indeed widely disputed, but whether you believe it or not, those are the rules. And even to this day, you are forced to abide by them. John had already done enough to be within seconds of earning the TKO victory, and yet, through his eagerness, or perhaps his inexperience within the sport, the referee quickly moved in to take a point from Bones for his actions. Upon telling Jones that he would also lose the dominant position as a result of his illegal strikes, it then emerged that Hamill would not be able to continue the fight. To be fair to him, he had already absorbed a tremendous amount of damage during the fight-ending sequence, and would have likely succumbed to the finish had the fight resumed. But as John wheeled away in celebration, believing himself to have just earned a TKO win, the fight's official announcement left him stunned. The bout was declared as a disqualification loss, leaving Matt Hamill as the victor. As you would expect, it was a pretty shocking moment as it happened. Indeed, it would not prove to be a devastating defeat for John Jones or his brand, but to this day, the fact that he does not walk to the octagon with a deserved zero in his record is quite a shame. 
In recent times, UFC President Dana White has attempted to get the bout's result overturned in the hopes of giving one of his flagship stars the type of pristine billing befitting a man of his talents. But of course, that single professional defeat remains on his record and likely will as long as he continues to fight. Matt Hamill would continue the run of form that led him to the John Jones fight with another pair of big wins, scoring back-to-back -back decision victories over Keith Jardine and the former champion Tito Ortiz before taking a number of losses that would eventually see him cut from the UFC. And though he didn't exactly beat John Jones to any degree, to this day, Hamill is known and often memed by the masses due to his possession of one of the most coveted prizes in the game. Indeed, there are a hell of a lot of asterisks to go along with that win, but it was certainly a career highlight, as odd as that may sound. On the other hand, John didn't waste any time in getting back in there, signing to fight Brandon Vera just three months later, a fight that he would win by way of first-round TKO. And from there, John Jones's momentum would indeed carry him to the light heavyweight title, placing him at the helm of a division that he would never again lose in. He would go on to defeat the champion Shogun Hua in masterful fashion before defending his title 11 times across two different reigns. Sure, his constant personal issues and the emergence of potential PED usage have stained the career of John Jones in the eyes of the fans, but for what it's worth, it could well be said that Jones is the single greatest example of a mixed martial artist we've ever had the pleasure of watching inside that octagon. As far as career blemishes are concerned, the Hamill DQ all in all is remembered as one of the stranger fights in UFC history. John took the defeat in his stride, and all things considered, it didn't exactly hurt his confidence moving forward. There is quite a lot of debate around the 12 to 6 elbow rule, with many experts having made it very clear that the angle of the elbow does not have as much of a bearing on its effectiveness as originally thought. A lot of people believe the rule to be more of a cosmetic feature than anything else, similar to the banning of soccer kicks that were widely used in Pride. For a sport that is always clamoring for mainstream approval, softening the blow of this game's brutality is always front and center in the plans of those who govern it. So, who knows, maybe one day the 12-6 elbow will get its time to shine. Either way, it directly contributed to the only defeat on the record of one of the single greatest fighters ever to lace up gloves. No matter what the circumstances, that's a pretty unique win to have on your resume.